footsteps of giants once thundered across the terrain of northern Kentucky, followed by the footsteps of native hunters. An independent pioneer spirit explored and settled Boone, Kenton, and Campbell counties. Now, on the eve of a great civil war, the traditions of its European immigrants mixed with the culture of the American South. Here, where the river bends. I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Abraham Lincoln, September 22nd, 1861. The geography of war was never more evident and the relationship nowhere more complex than in the border regions like northern Kentucky. Lincoln knew that uh, Kentucky was vital. Uh, Kentucky had so much of a border along the Ohio River that if Kentucky had seceded from the Union, uh, Lincoln felt that the war would have been very difficult to win. Uh, that's that's uh, one reason why he struggle with the issue of emancipation as he knew that Kentuckians would be very much opposed to emancipation. Kenton and Campbell counties, with strong ties to Cincinnati and a thriving industrial economy, were less immersed in the slave economy than many other parts of Kentucky. Boone County, however, with no major cities and a strong agricultural economy, had a slave population nearly three times as great as Kenton and Campbell combined. All told, by 1860, the three counties of northern Kentucky held more than 2,400 slaves. In the summer of 1862, Confederate forces led by General Kirby Smith and General Braxton Bragg swept through Kentucky. On September 2nd, Smith's troops, 11,000 strong, took Lexington without a fight. After telegraphing the Confederate high command that the heart of Kentucky is with the South in this struggle, Kirby Smith sent General Henry Heath and 8,000 men northward, setting off widespread panic in northern Kentucky and Cincinnati. General Lew Wallace was dispatched to Cincinnati to prepare for a Confederate attack. Arriving in Cincinnati, Wallace looked across the Ohio to the northern Kentucky communities hugging the south shore of the river and to the natural fortification that rose behind them. Fort Mitchell and a few other small fortifications were already established along the hilltops. This, Wallace decided, was where the Union forces would halt the Confederate advance. A call went up for volunteers, and almost overnight, General Wallace found himself in command of more than 70,000 troops. Men and boys streamed in from all directions. It was said these untrained, and often unruly, volunteers could kill a squirrel with no need for a second bullet. It was a skill that earned them the nickname Squirrel Hunters. One other group earned a nickname and a place in history in the frenzy of activity as the Confederate Army approached. When the crisis came and all the citizens of Cincinnati, Newport and Covington were ordered to report, uh, some of the African Americans in Cincinnati uh, came to the uh, mayor and applied to uh, to, uh, for the militia, and they were told, this is not for you, this is only for the, uh, the uh, white men. Then the, uh, the order came that uh, the police of Cincinnati were to round up the African-American men and put them in a pen on Plum Street and take them over to dig in the works, to throw up uh, the breastworks on the defensive line. So they, there were several hundred of them uh, brought across the river in this degrading way. They were not allowed to go home and get a cap or a coat. They're not allowed to say goodbye to their families. They were uh, terribly mistreated. And they were over in Northern Kentucky digging in the trenches. Learning of their plight, General Lew Wallace ordered that the men be allowed to return to their homes to gather some belongings. The very next morning after their release, each and every one of these men of what came to be known as the Black Brigade returned to Northern Kentucky and to the work of clearing trees and constructing forts. Moving so many troops and supplies across the river was a major undertaking. 
General Lew Wallace knew that he needed a bridge uh, that would be more effective than steamboat traffic. So he gathered the uh, civilian engineers of Cincinnati and described it and handed them a book and said, I need this pontoon bridge. Uh, they used steamboats to gather coal barges, and within 48 hours, they had the bridge built, and it was a very effective bridge. It worked well. Soon, a line of defense against the southern invasion spread out across the ridgetops of northern Kentucky. In addition to Fort Mitchell, there was Shaler Battery, named for the prominent Newport family that donated land for the battery. Battery Hooper, with its commanding view of the Licking River Valley. And Fort Wright, named for the commander of the Union forces in Kentucky. On September 13, 1862, less than two weeks after the Southern Army took Lexington and Frankfort without a fight, General Henry Heath, upon seeing the formidable Union defenses in northern Kentucky, withdrew his troops without firing a shot. Thanks to the hastily constructed defenses along the northern Kentucky hillsides, this region had the great fortune to be the site of one of the Civil War's greatest battles never fought. Though the region never saw a major battle, a number of sick and wounded soldiers from the war were treated at Covington's St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which opened in 1861. St. Elizabeth's was the result of the tireless efforts on the part of two local philanthropists, Henrietta Scott Cleveland and Sarah Worthington King Peter. Mrs. Cleveland decided to take the matter up with the Catholic Bishop of Covington. Her friend, Sarah Worthington King Peter, tells her to get the bishop to go to Cincinnati and visit St. Mary's Hospital, and then she'll have him hooked. They do that. He's so impressed with the Sisters of the Poor of St. Francis and their hospital there that they found a new hospital, St. Elizabeth in Covington. Northern Kentucky was home to the family of one of the Civil War's most famous figures. Throughout the Civil War, 520 Greenup Street in Covington was the home of Jesse Root and Hannah Simpson Grant, whose eldest son was commanding general of the Union forces, Ulysses S. Grant. When Vicksburg fell, when Grant captured Vicksburg, uh, there were victory marches in Covington and Newport, and they uh, lit bonfires, and they had a parade with, with a band that serenaded uh, Jesse and Hannah Grant. Former slaves and former slave owners in Northern Kentucky were legally granted equal rights after the war, but that soon changed. Back when slavery existed, there were always a handful of free blacks. Um, their numbers in Kentucky by the time of the Civil War may, may have been something like 20,000 uh, uh, in, in number. Well, there would be laws prohibiting them from most areas of society. And so after the Civil Wars, the laws that had applied to free blacks would now be written again to apply to all black people. When you start selectively enforcing who can vote, who can't vote, who can live in this community and who can live in this community, who can go to this school and who can't go to this school, who has an opportunity to get this job and who doesn't have an opportunity to get this job, then the issue of race becomes an issue. And I think that permeated the region. In 1874, the Kentucky legislature passed a law mandating that white and colored schools shall be forever kept and maintained separately. Another law required that only tax dollars from black citizens could be used to fund schools for black children. Ultimately, the task of providing educational opportunities for the region's black children fell largely to leading black citizens. Jacob Price was one such leader. Born into slavery in Woodford County, he was one of the first African-American businessmen in Covington, owning a lumber mill and other local real estate. In 1864, Jacob Price helped form the First Baptist Church, Northern Kentucky's oldest African-American church. And as an early advocate of educational opportunities for Covington's African-American population, 
he established a school in his home on Bremen Street. Jacob Price's dream of an African-American school was realized when Covington's 7th Street Colored School opened its doors in 1888. It would move to 9th Street and be renamed the Lincoln Grant School in honor of the slain president and a local politician named William Grant. The school became a defining landmark in Northern Kentucky's black community. Because of segregation, uh, the people who were forced to be together as a result of segregation uh, had to find their own strengths. Uh, there was very little in Covington for black people except the school. By the mid-1800s, Covington and Newport, Kentucky were both among the 100 largest cities in America. As northern Kentucky's population boomed, communities began filling gaps along the riverfront. In 1867, two small towns, Jamestown and Brooklyn, combined to form the city of Dayton. Three years later, the lands between Dayton and Newport, lands that had once belonged to Newport founder James Taylor, were developed by A.S. Berry to create the city of Bellevue, named after Taylor's riverfront estate. And on December 31, 1866, the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge was opened. At 1,057 feet, it was the longest suspension bridge in the world, a distinction it would hold for 17 years until another Roebling design structure, New York's Brooklyn Bridge, was completed. By 1870, more than one of every four people living in Kenton and Campbell counties was foreign born. The religious and cultural heritage of these immigrants would, in many ways, define Northern Kentucky for generations to come. And as with earlier waves of migration, many of them came from Germany. At least half of the German immigrants were Catholic. So this is another thing that flavors the German heritage of the area. And one thing that's interesting about all of the churches is that it attracted so many German artisans, architects, and artists to the area because they got jobs uh, creating the uh, paintings, the sculpture, uh, the woodwork, and so on in all these churches. And they also were involved in building homes and structures and offices in the greater Cincinnati area. And I think they really uh, beautified uh, the region, and I think that's kind of a spin-off of the German Catholic tradition on the area. German Catholics settled in several Covington neighborhoods, including the Mainstrasse area and the neighborhood surrounding Muttergottes, a German phrase meaning Mother of God. There was also a small but growing Jewish population in northern Kentucky. The first Jewish congregation was established in Newport in 1897, which gives you a good date on which to fix the, the arrival of Jews. Uh, there were probably just a few hundred at that point, but enough to establish a congregation. Uh, Covington's congregation was established in 1906, so you can see again right around the turn of the century is when you get significant numbers of Jews. During this era, many new and often large, elegant and ornate churches were constructed in Northern Kentucky. Most impressive of all was Covington St. Mary's, known officially as the Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption. Ground was broken on the basilica in the summer of 1894 and it was dedicated in 1901, although construction including the magnificent stained glass windows continued another 15 years. By the 1880s, the Newport Barracks, which had played such a crucial role in the development of Newport, was ready to take the high road, geographically speaking. Decades of flooding from the Ohio and Licking Rivers had taken their toll on the barracks, and the decision was made to close the arsenal and move to higher ground. Ironically, a former Confederate Army soldier, once held as a prisoner of war at Newport Barracks, would play a crucial role in the process. Samuel Bigstaff was just 17 when he was captured by Union forces in Tennessee. 
Eventually arriving as a prisoner at Newport Barracks, Big Staff's winning personality made him many friends, and when the war ended, he decided to stay in northern Kentucky. He attended law school, took a job, and invested in real estate. Samuel Big Staff came up with the plan to, if the Army would move the Newport Barracks up to the Highland area of Campbell County, up on the hills, um, he would donate uh, a considerable amount of land, figuring that the rest of the land he owned, people would eventually build shopping areas and residential areas around, and within 20 years that came uh, to be the fact. Samuel Bigstaff, much like James Taylor before him, was an entrepreneur who, by taking advantage of opportunity, was also instrumental in generating economic forces in northern Kentucky. While Samuel Bigstaff was planning his redesign of the landscape of northern Kentucky, Covington native Frank Duvenek, a son of German immigrants, was creating his own designs on canvas. Educated in Covington schools, Duvenek studied painting under Johann Schmidt, a well-known local artist whose murals graced many local churches. Duvenek later studied at the Royal Academy in Munich, Germany, where he developed his signature loose style of brushwork and dark, brooding palette. In 1890, following the sudden death of his wife, the artist returned home to northern Kentucky. As a painter, Duvenek was a major influence in the world of art. He was also known in particular as a teacher. Uh, many artists throughout the nation took classes from him and he was very influential in the art world. Uh, one of the things that he did that was somewhat uh, progressive during his time period was teaching women art, fine art. Uh, he had classes specifically for women to teach them to paint. John Yuri Lloyd was just four years old when his family moved from New York to Florence, Kentucky in 1853. Ten years later, Lloyd became apprenticed to a local chemist, and in 1886, he and his two brothers opened the Lloyd Brothers Pharmacy in Cincinnati. Well respected as a traditional pharmacist, John Yuri Lloyd also conducted extensive research on herbal remedies and created the first pharmaceutical preparations made from a daisy-like plant called echinacea. In his spare time, John Yuri Lloyd liked to write, and he published several novels about small town and rural life based on people and places in Boone County. If you talk about the heyday of brewing in northern Kentucky and Cincinnati, you have to talk about the mid to late 1800s into the very beginning of the 1900s. That's the time when immigrant culture peaked in this region, where the German presence was at its most pronounced, and at the same time when they exerted the most influence upon everyday culture throughout the region. One of northern Kentucky's largest and most famous breweries began operation around 1870 as the Jefferson Street Brewery in Newport. and then. A German immigrant named George Wiedemann bought into the business. In 1878, Wiedemann bought out his partner, and by the next year, Wiedemann's Brewing Company was the number one brewer in northern Kentucky. No less prominent, though, also at that time was what became the Bavarian Brewing Company, and that was established also before the primary figure known to it uh, came into the business. Raylan was my great-grandfather and he was born in Mulheim, Baden, Germany in 1850. And his mother came to America in uh, 1868 and left her two boys at home. <laughs> then in 1870 when my grandpa was 19 he came over to America and he arrived with a dollar and 15 cents in his pocket. William Reedland was, uh, as so many were, a German immigrant who brought his considerable skills and his work ethic to these shores and was willing to work very hard and ply his trade. And through thrift, through hard work and knowledge of his trade, uh, as so many German immigrants did, they built themselves into substantial entrepreneurs and made good on their uh, endeavors. I think William Reedland and all the German men that came were very, very brave and they, they must have had a wonderful goal and dream to leave everything behind and start fresh into a country that they didn't know what was going to 
happened to them or how it was going to treat them or how they were going to fare or what their future was going to be. I think they must have been very, very brave and far-seeing individuals. As the 20th century approached, Covington and Newport were the second and third largest cities in Kentucky. Having long since ceased striving to surpass the metropolis across the river, they increasingly viewed themselves, and were viewed by others, as suburbs of Cincinnati. I think when people think of Kentucky, they think of one of two things. They think of the bluegrass area, the Lexington area with the horse farms and the, the, the southern tradition or they think of Appalachia, the Eastern Kentucky Hill People tradition. And we don't really fit either. Um, we're industrial for the most part, or at least that's our tradition, and heavily immigrant um, influenced. I think Northern Kentucky in general developed differently than the rest of the state because of our closeness to Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnatians kind of see us as Kentuckians Kentuckians see us as Cincinnatians, so we're kind of somewhere in the middle. After taking 20 years to complete the first bridge across the Ohio, it took less than six years to build another. The l &N Railroad Bridge, also known as the Newport Bridge, was finished in 1872. In 1877, a second railroad span, the Cincinnati Southern Bridge at Ludlow, was completed, and the way was opened for new communities to develop in northern Kentucky. In 1887, developers in what would become Erlanger, Kentucky, began to have Sunday excursions out on the trains to their development, free Sunday excursions, come out and see our lots, perhaps buy a lot, build in the quiet of the country, but still be close enough to the city's amenities. And as one of their promotions, the railroad offered one year's free commuting on the Cincinnati Southern to Erlanger in exchange for buying a lot and building a home. Commuter trains opened up some areas, but until the late 1800s, most northern Kentuckians had only one way to travel. There were no paved streets prior to uh, the early 1900s, and so uh, you had absolutely no way of getting around them unless, except by foot, unless you were among the upper middle class or upper class who could afford a, a, a horse and buggy and a carriage house out back and all that. Uh, so the, uh, the horse car lines and, and later the street car lines in northern Kentucky were a quantum leap in allowing people to actually live a little further away from their jobs too. The streetcar introduced in 1890 tripled the speed by which people could travel to an amazing 18 miles per hour. This new technology prompted more suburb growth in northern Kentucky. It actually allowed other subdivisions then uh, to be built further out, uh, Rosedale and Latonia in Kenton County uh, and Fort Thomas, especially in, in, in uh, Campbell County. Many of the streetcar's passengers were illiterate, so the cars were painted in identifying colors. On the main street line in Covington, that color was green. By the late 1890s, all the cars on the Northern Kentucky lines were painted that same green color, and the company that owned them, the Cincinnati, Newport, and Covington Railway Company, came to be known as the Green Line. For most people, the Green Line provided new opportunities, but for one young lady, it was a one-way ride to the end of the line. On a February morning in 1896, a man passing through an orchard on Alexandria Pike near Fort Thomas made a gruesome discovery, the headless body of a pregnant young woman. It was, it was a national story because early on, the, the coroner ruled that she was apparently still alive when they started cutting off her head based on how the blood had squirted out. And the newspapers at the time picked up on the story and ran it. And um, 
it uh, became just a, na a national craze as to uh, um, who, who actually committed the crime. The victim was eventually identified through her custom-made shoes as 23-year-old Pearl Bryan from Indiana. Knowing the identity of the victim, police soon turned to a University of Cincinnati dental student, Scott Jackson, and his friend, Alonzo Walling. Jackson was named as the father of Pearl's unborn child, and the pair were arrested. In separate trials, both were convicted of the murder of Pearl Bryan. Supposedly, they uh, drugged this girl with um, cocaine or some other sort of a narcotic and took her out on what would have been the old Alexandria Pike in for, what is now Fort Thomas and uh, cut her head off while she was still alive. And the head was never found. Although neither man ever admitted his guilt, on the morning of May 20th, 1897, Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling were taken from their cells at the Campbell County Jail in Alexandria to the courthouse in Newport. There, they were hanged for the murder of Pearl Bryan. It was a major event. They gave out tickets that day. It was just like a circus atmosphere down in Newport when it took place. It could be said that Fort Thomas got its name from that fact because even though the city was called uh, District of the Highlands at the time, all the news, newspaper accounts said, you know, Dateline Fort Thomas. Northern Kentucky would produce two governors in the late 19th century. The first, John White Stevenson, was elected lieutenant governor in 1867, then succeeded John Helm, who died just five days after his inauguration. Uh, the second governor from Northern Kentucky would be William Goebel, who's, um, who was born in Pennsylvania of German immigrant parents. And it's kind of surprising, but Goebel gravitated to the Democratic Party which was largely seen as, as the party of former Confederates. However, he saw it as the party of the working man. Here was a man who had literally sold newspapers and you know, had worked his way up from nothing to be a very powerful attorney and a powerful political figure. And so Goebel came to the forefront as a very different politician than most Kentuckians had experienced. And many people never could accept this and saw him in ways that were very antagonistic. William Goebel was a law partner of Northern Kentucky's two most powerful politicians, John White Stevenson and John G. Carlyle, and was a wealthy man by the time he was elected to the state senate in 1886. In Frankfurt, he became a vocal advocate of civil rights, workers' rights, and strict regulation of railroads. He was also strongly opposed to the state lottery. William Goebel had uh, enemies within his own party because of his stands. Uh, one of those enemies was a man named John Sanford. Uh, Sanford was an important politician in Goebel's hometown as well. Uh, the two men became political enemies. Goebel, in fact, even purchased a newspaper. And in that newspaper, one day, he published a line in which he referred to Sanford as Gonorrhea John. Uh, Sanford was not amused. And the two men met on the streets of Covington. Sanford confronted Goebel about what he had written. Suddenly, two shots rang out, and John Sanford fell dead. Goebel calmly walked to the police station, where he turned himself in. A judge ruled that since both men had been carrying guns, and both had fired them, there was insufficient evidence to bring charges. Despite the shooting, Goebel was named the Democratic nominee for governor in 1900, running against Republican William Taylor. Uh, when the results start coming in, the official results seem to show that the Republican Taylor had won by 2,000 votes over William Goble of Covington. Taylor sworn in as governor. Everything seems to be going on in a normal way. But the Democratic majority in the legislature wanted to examine the returns because they felt like there had been illegal ballots cast, that the militia had been called out in Louisville to influence the election illegally. Tensions were high in the Kentucky capital. You literally had what was unheard of in American history, a capital city of Frankfurt really on the verge of civil war, 
with armed supporters for each side, the Democratic side of Goebel and the Republican side, wondering if, in fact, this is going to break out into civil war when, of course, shots rang out from the Capitol building. Unknown assailants had shot William Goebel in the chest while he was walking in front of the state capitol. The next day, the legislature hastily convened, ruled that Goebel was the victor, and he was sworn in on the last day of January 1900. Three days later, William Goebel died, the only sitting governor in American history to be assassinated. Growing up in Covington, Kentucky, on the banks of the Licking and Ohio Rivers, Daniel Carter Beard spent much of his childhood fishing and swimming, roaming the woods, and imagining himself as an early Kentucky pioneer. The son of well-known painter James Henry Beard, it was perhaps only natural that Dan Beard would pursue a career as an artist. In 1882, he combined his artistic talent and his passion for the outdoors in the American Boys Handy Book. The book offered ideas and illustrated instructions for hundreds of outdoor activities, from kite building and knot tying to boat construction. In 1906, Dan Beard founded the Sons of Daniel Boone, an organization for young boys based on frontier traditions. Four years later, he merged the Sons of Daniel Boone into a newly formed organization, the Boy Scouts of America. Daniel Carter Beard, known to generations of Boy Scouts as Uncle Dan, held the post of National Scout Commissioner for 30 years. The American Boys Handybook remains in print to this day. If you think of the people cramped up in old walking cities like Covington, Newport, and Cincinnati, houses on 25-foot lots, uh, close to one another, very few park facilities available, and drinking water. The Cincinnati water was among the worst water. They, they got the water below Deer Creek in Cincinnati, which was a place where there were slaughterhouses and blood running into the stream and all kinds of waste. We think of 19th century cities sometimes in an idyllic sort of fashion, but actually they were dirty awful places with pigs running around on the streets and I suppose you would have done anything to get out and to recreate someplace nice. By the beginning of the 20th century, Covington leaders recognized the need for open spaces, creating a park board. Their cause was helped tremendously a few years later when the DeVoos, a prominent local family, donated their home and 500 acres of land for the city. William DeVue Sr. was a wholesale milliner who had um, a business in downtown Cincinnati. But he dabbled in a lot of other things. They farmed the land. He was uh, a little bit involved with the railroad. So he had other income as well. And this became their summer home, which then eventually did become their full-time residency as well. When the parents passed away, the two sons at that time decided they wanted to create a memorial for their parents and at that time donated the estate of DeVue Park as well as their home to the city of Covington. DeVoe Park soon became one of Northern Kentucky's most popular recreation areas, but far from the only one. The sandbars along the south shore of the Ohio that had once been bemoaned as a hindrance to navigation and development were now an attraction, and to some, a shocking display of impropriety. Bathing beaches lined the shore, places with names like Queen City, Manhattan, Tacoma. Tacoma Beach, they called it up in the, uh, Dayton. Yeah, that was a big thing in them days, yeah. And then they Take were it. clean. Oh, yeah, it was very clean. clean. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. M my dad used to swim across the Ohio oh, yeah. he, what, There weren't uh, flood balls then. No, no walls. Uh, and the, the river wasn't that wide, as wide as it is now. For those who preferred spectator sports, local businessmen, observing the success of Louisville's new Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby, decided to create a similar racetrack in northern Kentucky. As Louisville developed its track, it was rather logical then 
that a metropolitan track could be built here in northern Kentucky. And a group of central Kentucky horsemen joined with some northern Kentucky prominent officials, some judges and lawyers, to uh, form an association, the Latonia Agricultural Association. In 1882, they got a charter. And in 1883, they opened a racetrack. Opening day at Latonia drew a crowd of 10,000. Within weeks, Kentucky Derby winners from Churchill Downs would nose their way across Latonia's finish line. The track attracted racing fans from as far away as Chicago and Cleveland. And before long, Central Kentucky horsemen and horsemen from all over the region were sending horses to Latonia. And to be quite honest about it, Latonia was at least equal to, if not superior, to Churchill Downs by 10 years into its existence. It was drawing especially two-year-olds from uh, Central Kentucky to be tried out here. The track was conditioned for lightning speed. It had all the top jockeys. Uh, in that era, the top jockeys mainly were black jockeys. They'd come out of a colony of jockeys in Central Kentucky, and there were a lot of important, like Isaac Murphy, who's famous and buried down at the Horse Park, many others, Billy Sims and James, James Sue Perkins. And so this track took off immediately. Latonia Racetrack and Churchill Downs, along with the Lexington Association track, formed a circuit of racetracks encouraging owners to keep their horses racing in Kentucky. It was called the 3L circuit for Latonia, Lexington, and Louisville. By the turn of the century, streetcars were making travel easy and the streetcar companies were always looking for ways to get more riders. And about everywhere where our streetcar line ended, there was some kind of an entertainment. In, in Campbell County, one end of the streetcar line ended up at the um, bathing, bathing beaches. Another one ended up in Fort Thomas at the military post. And in <clears throat> Canton County, one end ended up at Lagoon Amusement Park. The Lala Lagoon was an amusement park that was basically developed by investors who were involved in the street railroad company here in northern Kentucky. And they had built a line that went into Ludlow, but um, they wanted something at the end of the line that would attract large numbers of riders. And so they came up with the idea of there's a small creek that goes into the Ohio River called the Pleasant Run. And they came up with the idea of damming it. And it, uh, a 55 acre lake was formed by damming the, the creek. While the lake was a nice place to take a picnic, the streetcar company decided it was an ideal location to build an amusement park. The Lagoon opened in 1894 and was an immediate success. It had a roller coaster that went over the lake, a carousel from the World's Fair, and a Ferris wheel that was built on one of the lake's islands. It evolved over the years into the largest amusement park in the area. Uh, in the summer months, there were cars leaving Fountain Square in Cincinnati every few minutes headed for the lagoon. It had a um, large clubhouse, which is one of the few things that's, that's remained. Uh, it had a large dance um, floor. Uh, they had orchestras there almost every night in the summer. For 20 years, the lagoon attracted huge crowds to its myriad of attractions. Then, disaster struck. 1913, we had a major flood in northern Kentucky. 1915, we had a major tornado that swept through the area that did major damage to the lagoon. The biggest blow was probably 1918. Um, the U.S. government stopped liquor production for the war effort, that the grain was needed to feed the boys overseas. And so there was no, 1918, there would be no uh, beer sales, and that pretty much killed it. Um, it never opened afterwards. The closing of the lagoon marked the end of an era. War, prohibition, a wave of organized crime, and a Great Depression all loomed on the horizon. No one could see it yet, but this place where the river bends was about to become a very different place indeed. In the early 20th century, the northern edge of Kentucky was in an enviable position, a region with both urban appeal and small town feel. 
the bend in the river was still attractive to the newest Americans, immigrants arriving from across Europe, including a small but vibrant community of Italians. Our grandfather, Giovanni Sheffardini, came to America on April 23, 1908. Um, at that time, my grandmother uh, was in, uh, in Italy. She was in her town of Magnolia del Trino. She was pregnant with their oldest child. And what they brought to um, our community was a real sense of family, of faith, and of community. They were looking for a better way of life. They were looking to uh, be able to educate their children, something that many of them never enjoyed. Um, so it was a chance to begin anew and to start in a new place where they could make everything their own. As with the German immigrants of an earlier century, the Italians who made Northern Kentucky their home found a landscape of undulating hills and valleys reminiscent of the ones they had left behind. And, as is known by all those whose lives play out where rivers flow, that landscape could be both a blessing and a curse. Flooding was an ever-present danger along the Ohio and Licking rivers, striking with regularity and leaving devastation in its wake. In 1913 alone, there were two major floods, the first in January, then another in April. Two years later, tornadoes ripped through the valley, with major damage in virtually every river town on both sides of the Ohio. As terrible as the natural disasters were, northern Kentuckians with roots in the old country were confronting even greater devastation, this time from the hands of man, when in 1914, Europe erupted into war. When the United States entered what would come to be called the World War, the military barracks in Fort Thomas became a recruitment and induction center for the U.S. Army. Northern Kentucky watched as thousands of young men passed through on their way over there. One of those soldiers was Lieutenant Samuel Woodfill. Sent to the battlefront on an October morning, Samuel Woodfill single-handedly took out three German machine gun nests, killing the gunners in hand-to-hand -hand combat. For his heroism in saving countless American lives that day, Samuel Woodfill was awarded the nation's highest military award for valor, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Another Northern Kentuckian soldier of that era, General John Tolliver Thompson, a descendant of one of Newport's founding families, never actually served in the war. He resigned his army commission just before America's entry into the war to begin an arms manufacturing company called the Auto Ordnance Corporation. That company and its founder would be barely a footnote in a history text, if not for a single weapon Thompson developed, specifically for use in the trenches of the World War. Described by the general as a one-man, hand-held machine gun. The weapon did not see service in the war, though. It was not perfected until 1921. Still, the Thompson submachine gun, or as it later came to be known, the Tommy gun, was quickly embraced by police departments and criminals across America. As the war in Europe raged on, the American public was getting daily updates in the newspaper. They were constant reminders that America was confronting an enemy, and that enemy was German. German Americans were suspected of being too sympathetic to the German Empire, and in places like northern Kentucky, where many citizens had long proudly clung to their German heritage, the suspicions and accusations had a lasting impact. Before World War I, the German community was still a strong community. They still had German churches, speaking churches. German was still taught even in the public schools as well as the Catholic schools. There were German newspapers in Cincinnati that served the region, German books and libraries. The war changed all that. Libraries destroyed their German books. Schools stopped teaching the language. Even streets and businesses were given new, more patriotic names. The anti-German hysteria fostered during the World War 
may have provided the final catalyst needed for a new social experiment. Temperance groups, like the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union, had long been lobbying to curtail alcoholic beverages in America. Their cause got a boost during the war years when the nation's breweries, including Covington's Bavarian Brewery and Wiedemann's in Newport, were shut down. The whole idea of uh, consuming alcohol when soldiers were dying in Europe for you became an unacceptable uh, kind of behavior, especially if that meant that you weren't performing up to high efficiency levels in the factory or on the farm because our boys overseas needed the products that we were producing and it became almost treasonous in the eyes of many to in any way impair our national productivity or efficiency by indulging in alcohol. The war ended in 1918, but prohibition did not. On October 28, 1919, Congress passed the National Prohibition Act, making it illegal to import, export, transport, sell, or manufacture alcoholic beverages. This was something that uh, German Americans couldn't really understand. First of all, because they felt uh, the government should not have any right to legislate what you should be allowed to drink. They felt the government has no right to do that. That's the, the right of the individual. And also it affected the industry of the area because so many people were involved in, in the brewing industry. The big losers, to be sure, in Prohibition were the brewers themselves, when you talk about beer production, consumption, and marketing. Because when Prohibition took place, their livelihood was taken away from them, and there was no compensation. The business itself was undermined to the point where many had to close, if not immediately, shortly after Prohibition began, because they could no longer market their primary products, and their attempt to market other things, such as near beer, or soft drinks, or ice, uh, oftentimes failed as well because, again, people didn't necessarily want that product. William Regan wasn't real thrilled with making soft drinks. He didn't exactly approve of them. And so my mother was four at the time, and he told my grandma not to let her drink any of those soft drinks that they'd wind up killing her. He said beer was much better for her. The effect of prohibition on northern Kentucky was immediate and long-lasting. Prohibition finished off of the German culture what the anti-German hysteria of World War I had begun. The Lagoon Amusement Park, which in just five years suffered flooding, a tornado, and a major fire, closed for good in 1918. At Coney Island kind of replaced the lagoon for many northern Kentuckians. Um, there, were, there was Covington Day, Newport Day, Ludlow Day, Bellevue. All the river cities had a day at Coney. And they would send one of the large um, paddle wheelers over to the city and that you know people who wanted to go would, would board and, and go to Coney Island for the day. I know in Ludlow in the, in the 20s and 30s, the, the town would be empty. I mean, everybody would go to Ludlow Day at, the, at Coney Island. So it was a, a real big event for Northern Kentuckians. As Coney Island Amusement Park flourished along the North Bank, the famous bathing beaches of Dayton and Bellevue, which had once attracted as many as 20,000 people a day, were failing, and with good reason. As communities and industries developed upstream, they often included the latest in modern plumbing, but then relied on an age-old system for getting rid of the waste. So the sewage and this nice new piping was when we went right into the Ohio River and then went, went down the river. And the first place it came to was the bathing beaches in Bellevue and Dayton. And uh, they, they soon discovered that uh, people didn't want to go swimming, particularly in the summertime when maybe the water was only 10 feet deep or so and sewage was coming down. From its bathing beaches to the Lagoon Amusement Park and Latonia Racetrack, Northern Kentucky had long been providing recreation for the region's citizens. But more and more, Northern Kentucky, and especially Newport, was beginning to attract a different kind of crowd. Newport was always a kind of a rough and tumble sort of place from the time the Newport Barracks located there in 1803. Anytime you have a bunch of young single men around, 
there are elements of society which will cater to their, to their interests. So Newport always had a reputation from earlier on, but it was really prohibition that, that enlarged that image. Northern Kentucky was much like the rest of America in its disregard for prohibition, but most of America would not be affected like Northern Kentucky. Bootleggers moved into the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky area like George Remus, who supposedly at one time controlled one-seventh of the nation's whiskey supply. Chicago lawyer-turned-bootlegger George Remus was cunning and crooked. Finding loopholes in the prohibition law that allowed distilleries to manufacture and sell liquor for medicinal purposes, Remus moved to Cincinnati and bought a pharmacy chain as a front for his bootlegging enterprise. In less than three years, George Remus was among Cincinnati's wealthiest and most generous citizens. His mansion in Cincinnati's Price Hill neighborhood was site of a lavish party on New Year's Eve 1922 that included gifts of diamond jewelry and new cars for his guests. He was also a master of the art of political graft, putting judges, police officers, and mayors on the payroll to ensure that they would look the other way as liquor flowed through their jurisdictions. Remus eventually served two years in an Atlanta federal prison. While he was away, his wife Imogene took up with another man, ironically, a federal agent. This was apparently more than the bootleg king could bear. Following his release from prison, George Remus shot and killed his wife. The subsequent murder trial shared front-page headlines across the country with Charles Lindbergh's famous transatlantic flight to Paris. Remus, acting as his own attorney, got himself off by reason of temporary insanity. But when he tried to return to bootlegging, Remus soon discovered that in his absence, the well-heeled and well-armed crime syndicates of Cleveland and Chicago had set up business in Newport. George Remus, the man who had made millions as bootleg king, was forced into retirement, living out the next 25 years in a modest home in Covington. Probably the Capone gang out of Chicago at one point, at least in the early probation years, had control of this region. Later, there's no question that the area was controlled by what was known as the Mayfield gang out of uh, Cleveland. Uh, the, the Chicago syndicate and the Cleveland syndicate were fighting over northern Kentucky as to whose territory it would belong to. One month in the 1920s, there were several dozen murders in uh, Campbell County alone, which was an enormous number for that time. Uh, and it was shocking to people that this was going on. Newport earned the nickname Little Mexico. It was not a term of endearment. I think beginning in Prohibition and during the time of the syndicate rule is really when Cincinnatians' attitudes toward northern Kentucky changed for the worse. They began to regard it as a, an unpleasant place, a place that had a lot of corruption and crime. And those changes in their attitude literally led to something that up through almost the 1980s or 1990s held sway, and that is this kind of negative, pejorative image of northern Kentucky. In those days, Latonia Racetrack thrived and the track's premier event, the Latonia Derby, rivaled Louisville's Kentucky Derby for both dollars and dazzle. There were huge crowds, I have pictures of them, just throngs of people with the straw hats in the 1930s fashion and 1920s fashion that you're so familiar with from the movies, uh, lined endlessly, the cars, the trains, uh, the rail cars and the trains were pouring out to Latonia. It was a vibrant, busy place. Such a vibrant, busy place and one in which large sums of money changed hands, would not escape the notice of some of the region's newest residents. Also what was happening was the mafia the mob had gotten in here and had set up all kinds of bookie operations and they were betting and there were every corner tavern had a bookie uh, working in there and so on. By the mid-1930s, the Cleveland Crime Syndicate was firmly entrenched in Newport. In 1933, things in the region changed again as prohibition was repealed. Breweries were legally open, jobs once again available, 
But if there were no longer huge profits to be made in bootlegging, there was still money to be made in other ways. By 1934, the syndicate was actively running many of Newport's illegal gambling parlors, known as bookie joints. An independent entrepreneur, Pete Schmidt, entered the gambling scene, buying a hotel on Monmouth Street, naming it the Glen Hotel after his son. Even though Schmidt's place was small time, it was a problem for the syndicate. Harassment was constant, and Schmidt closed his hotel one year later. But Pete Schmidt had bigger ideas that would set the stage for Northern Kentucky's image. He opened what would be the first true casino in the region. He called it the Beverly Hills Club. Pete Schmidt would eventually be forced to sell the Beverly Hills to the Cleveland Crime Syndicate. But the elegant Beverly Hills Club marked a new era in the history of Northern Kentucky. Little Mexico had become a gambling mecca later to be described as Las Vegas before Las Vegas. Over the next quarter of a century, this would define this place where the river bent.